Let's start, if you'll pardon the expression, with something that's in the wind. And we go to Kevin Brebner, who sent us a story from a place called Ainsworth, Nebraska. In many ways, Ainsworth is a lot like your average Midwestern town. Probably pretty similar to most towns along Nebraska's Highway 20. But there's something else in Ainsworth. Something that makes it a little different than the rest of them. Something that could be the key to our economy's revival. Well, you know, we heard about this thing for a number of years before it become reality. And uh, in my personal opinion, it was it was an interesting deal to to have a an, an economic impact to our community, which it had a very good economic impact. But Ainsworth's success was mostly due to the town's openness to the idea of wind energy development, an attitude that, if mimicked, might be the key to utilizing the valuable natural resource that wind is. It's expensive energy, I understand that, but uh, wind is here to stay. Someday we'll run out of coal and oil. And I think, you know, the more people become aware of of what wind energy is, I think the more positive it is to everybody. Hunter, what do you make of Ainsworth, Nebraska? It's a lovely story. We need efficiency first, because that will make all of the renewables... Well, you're not saying Ainsworth is wasting its time with wind. That's pretty it's impressive It's not stuff. wasting its time, but it would be... It, the wind would, there would go a great deal further if they did what Osage, Iowa did. In 1979, a man named Wes Birdsall went around with a little thermograph and he shot pictures of people's houses and showed where the heat was leaking out and a guy came right behind with a caulk gun. That simple program saved a million dollars a year in this rural town. You talk about planet forward, let's look at the future and come back. Our future is Denmark. 20% of, of their generation comes from wind. Interestingly enough, so much wind that at night they get too much wind, they get to sell it to Germany and pay the Germans to take the wind. They got nowhere to store it. <laughs> and so what, what Denmark decided... Something in the wind there, too. Yeah, <laughs> Denmark decided to do now. They said, we need storage. Interestingly enough, the best storage for wind power at night? Yeah. Parked electric cars. So if you got a lot of electric cars parked, lots of batteries, sort of like Google of batteries, they store it at night, they drive them in day. And so if we go all the way on wind, 20 30% renewable generation from wind, we got to store it. Is this something, because right now wind represents about 1.5% of our power. What do you expect here? What, what are we going to be seeing in the next several years? Can we get to the 20% that some talk about? Well, theoretically, you can get to the 20, maybe even 30%. That work's been done to show how that could happen. 30% of our power? Yes. Over what period of time? Um, over the next 20 years. However, there are huge obstacles to getting there. So it's not the technical capacity. It's actually more of the political willingness to cite these massive wind farms. Uh, there's a lot of nimbyism, not in my backyard, is now bananas, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> and so you have to overcome that. Um, but, but this is what it ends up being about. It ends up being about choice. Do you want it or don't you? And if you want it, you, then you've got to get out of the way and make it happen. You also heard from a city guy who runs a restaurant, organized a bunch of businesses. The restaurant actually is a bit of a landmark place. President Barack Obama has already been there. Here's Ben's Chili Bowl. <laughs> Hello, I'm Nizam Ali from Ben's Chili Bowl in Washington, and I really believe that businesses should step up and switch their energy to 100% wind power. Uh, we're a 50-year-old family business, and we were able to do it very easily. Uh, we actually got a group of uh, people, a lot of local businesses in D.C., and have a group called Think Local First. We all got together and uh, put our, our, all of our businesses' energy bills together and brokered a deal to get 100% wind power. And it's easy to do. It's great for the environment. It's the right thing to do for our kids and for our country. And we encourage you all to do that. Jim Connaughton, start us off. Explain what is happening out of Ben's Chili Bowl, because what he's done is he's bought, brought a group of businesses together, and they're buying wind certificates, right? That's right. We now have a chance for consumers to speak up and make their own choice about the kind of energy they want. And so now with groups like this, they can consolidate. But anybody can do this? Uh, it I depends. mean, I can't do this as an individual, can I? Uh, not right now, but in some states you can. But the movement is growing where any consumer should be able to have choice as to their electricity mix. Boys, again, if you, <laughs> if you invest first in efficiency, then you need a lot fewer windmills. No, actually, efficiency is a critical ongoing step, but you need to be able to invest to become more efficient. Okay, well, let's talk about it. And you need money for that, and you need a good economy for that. 
Oh, details, details. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know the what? Money, you, but you, the... cannot, you cannot have a good economy if we don't invest in efficiency. On the study in Oregon showed per megawatt saved in a community, you'll generate over $2 million in increased economic output, over half a million dollars in increased wages, and you will get 10 times the number of jobs that you would get from investing in any central station plant. I, I got into the act, too, and I went out. And one of the places I went to is the National Renewable Energy Labs in Golden, Colorado. Now, they are the ones who are trying to get us into the future. I want to introduce you to James Johnson, who is working on next-generation windmills. And some of them are just astounding. These things are huge. They are. 45 meters long in some cases. We're looking at the way the machine behaves in the inflow of the atmosphere. What does that mean, inflow of the atmosphere? Inflow is the, the wind. As, <laughs> as the wind blows, it changes direction, changes speed. Don't we already know that? Not for these size machines. It's an optimized machine for what we call class two and class three wind regimes, which are the predominant wind locations in North America. The rough translation, as I understand it, is getting more power out of, a, out of less wind. Exactly. With this kind of power, we're buying it up front. I mean, we're accustomed to pay as you go right now. The reason that most people aren't aware of front-loading those costs is because all that purchasing was done by our grandparents. So the Rural Electric Association that was, you know, all that infrastructure that was installed, the interstate highway system that Lyndon Johnson and Dwight Eisenhower built were all done by our parents and grandparents, right. and, we're, and we're blind to that. You've got to build the infrastructure, you've got to build the windmills, you've got to build the plugs, you've you got know, to build the cars. You know, it's, a, it's not a question of plugs or cars or batteries or windmills. It's a question of leadership. 